28th March is a dark day in Tibetan history. On that day in 1959, the Tibetan government was dissolved by China. Tibetans lost all their freedom and autonomy to an autocratic China. Tibet on China's borders was once a de facto independent and peace-loving country that followed Tibetan Buddhism. But China crushed the Tibetan uprising occupied Tibet with brute force and destroyed Tibetan culture. Tens of thousands of Tibetans who raised their voice against the Chinese occupation were killed. Tibet was fully captured and annexed by China. So why did China capture Tibet? What followed in Tibet and what is the situation there now? Hello and welcome to Connecting the Dots. I'm Munman Bhattacharya. Let's connect the dots of China's invasion of Tibet. On 10th March 1959, the Chinese government invited Dalai Lama to watch a theatrical show by a Chinese dance troupe. This invitation came with strange conditions. No Tibetan soldiers were to accompany the Dalai Lama and his bodyguards had to be unarmed. This made the people of Lhasa, the Tibetan capital, where the Dalai Lama lived suspicious. They were afraid that this could be China's plan to kidnap or arrest the Dalai Lama or worse, assassinate him. That's because some days back, the Chinese government had sent their soldiers to Lhasa and these soldiers had surrounded the city. As anxiety spread over the invitation, an uprising started. Soon, tens of thousands of Tibetans gathered around the Norbulinka Palace the summer residence of the Dalai Lama. They were determined to protect their leader at all costs. Seven days passed. On 17th March 1959, the Dalai Lama consulted his advisor, the Neijing Oracle, on what his next move should be. The Dalai Lama was advised to flee to save his life. So disguised as a common soldier, he slipped past the massive throng of people outside along with a small group of people. As soon as the Chinese government came to know about his escape, they dispatched military planes and search parties to look for him. And at one point, Chinese military planes came very close to them, but could not spot them. For 13 days, they trekked through the perilous Himalayan range and reached the final Tibetan village on the border with India. Now, there is a good deal of history on both sides of this great escape. Turn the clock to 1949. For almost 40 years before that, Tibet was a de facto independent country. But with 1949 came a big change. On 1st October 1949, Chinese Communist Party Chairman Mao Zedong proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China or the modern Chinese state as we know it today. But before the proclamation, the CCP had made a top priority to annex Tibet. Why? The reasons were both ideological and pragmatic. China wanted to shore up its southwestern border and access Tibet's plentiful natural resources. Ideologically for the CCP, Tibet was a feudal theocracy whose people needed quote-unquote liberation. Tibet's annexation was also seen as the culmination of a historical project. In 1950, Radio Beijing announced, the task of the People's Liberation Army for 1950 is to liberate Tibet. Liberation meant occupation. Mao Zedong was a staunch communist. He was strictly against all religions. He wanted no religion or hierarchies. And he believed that Tibet was a part of China. On 1st January 1950, the Chinese army declared national sovereignty over Tibet. Chinese government demanded that representatives of Tibet arrive in Beijing by 16th September 1950. But Tibetan officials ignored the demand. Then China upped the ante. On 7th October 1950, Chinese troops entered Tibet. And on 19th October 1950, 
they captured the town of Kamdo. Dalai Lama writes in his autobiography about how the Tibetan army was heavily outnumbered by the Chinese PLA. 40,000 to 80,000 Chinese soldiers crossed the Trichu River east of Kamdo. This meant soon Lhasa would fall to the invaders. In a situation like that, Tibetans turned to their spiritual leader. They wanted Dalai Lama to be given full temporal or political authority. So, on 17th November 1950, he was officially enthroned as the temporal leader of Tibet or its head of state. He was only 15 years old then. Dalai Lama then turned to the United Nations for help. On 18th November 1950, the UN General Assembly condemned the Chinese invasion of the Tibetan region, but nothing changed on ground. So in a last bid to avoid a full-scale Chinese invasion, the Dalai Lama sent the then governor of Kham to Beijing to open a dialogue with the Chinese. The delegation was not empowered to reach any settlement. Its task was only to convince the Chinese leadership not to invade Tibet. But the most unexpected turn of events played out for Tibet. On 23rd May 1951, a harsh crackling voice on the radio announced that a 17-point agreement had been signed by the representatives of the Chinese government and what they call the local government of Tibet. The Chinese, who even forged the Tibetan seal, had forced the delegation into signing the agreement at gunpoint. So what did the agreement say? The first point was not acceptable to the Tibetans. The Tibetan people shall unite and return to the family of the motherland, the People's Republic of China. But the rest of the document looked reasonable because it promised autonomy to Tibet, respect for Buddhism and no change by the Chinese government in the existing political system in Tibet. Positions and power of the Lai Lama were to continue. But guess what? Over the years, China reneged on those promises. It did the opposite of what it had promised. Dalai Lama then went on his first foreign visit outside Tibet. For one year, from July 1954, he was in China. There he met Mao Zedong and other Chinese leaders. He toured Chinese provinces and was impressed by the development projects he saw there. But this was a Chinese strategy. The first steps of China's re-education plans. Mao Zedong wanted Tibet to be like China and adopt the Chinese culture because he believed in one country, one culture, one nation. The next year, the Dalai Lama visited India. And as per some accounts, here he met some Tibetan guerrilla warriors or Tibetan freedom fighters who had taken up arms and were trying to fight the Chinese occupation. This was an eye-opener for the Dalai Lama as he realized the full truth about what China was doing. China had suppressed the freedom of Tibetans completely. It was not a liberation. China was colonizing Tibet and committing war crimes. By 1959, a proper Tibetan resistance had emerged. Remember, the same year that the Dalai Lama had escaped into exile in India. Coming back to that, just before reaching the border with India, Dalai Lama poured his heart out in a cable he had sent to the then Indian Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. The government of Tibet have tried their best to maintain good relations with China, but the Chinese have been trying to take away powers from the Tibetan government and in some areas, they are making preparations for war. On 17th March 1959 at 4 p.m., the Chinese fired two shells in the direction of my residence. They could not do much damage, but as our lives were in danger, I and some of my trusted people managed to escape the same evening at 10 p.m. On 31st March 1959, Dalai Lama entered India with his entourage through Arunachal Pradesh. A detachment of the Assam Rifles received him at the border. He was immediately treated by India as an honored guest and for the past 65 years, he has remained so. And what happened to Tibet? On 25th March 1959, Chinese army entered Lhasa. On 28th March, the Chinese government dissolved the local Tibetan government. Mao Zedong vowed revenge against India. He was quoted as saying, 
let the Indian government commit all the wrongs for now. When the time comes, we will settle accounts with them. And we know how China settled those accounts by attacking India in 1962. In 1965, the Chinese government established the Tibetan Autonomous Region. China imposed its One Nation, One Culture idea on Tibet. Since the invasion, around 1.2 million Tibetans have been killed. More than 6,000 Buddhist monasteries have been destroyed. 340,000 Tibetans have died in famines. Tibet's natural resources have been exploited. Even nuclear and toxic waste were disposed there. Many Tibetans died from starvation and hard labor while in captivity. And the uprisings against Chinese occupation continued. The biggest protests were seen from 1987 to 1989. People came out in large numbers, calling for Tibetan independence. But China declared martial law. 400 people died in clashes. The next big wave of protests happened months before the 2008 Beijing Olympics. At least 19 Tibetans died then. In 2011, there were self-immolation protests and newer forms of protests emerged after that. Today, Dalai Lama is 88 years old. The question is, what after him? He says he plans to live beyond the age of 113 and he will address the question of his succession when he turns 90 in 2025. But China would want the next Dalai Lama to be its puppet, just as it appointed a puppet as Panchim Lama. China had even abducted Gedun Choki Niyama after he was recognized by the Dalai Lama as the 11th Panchim Lama. He was only six years old then. He is still missing for the last 29 years. But the Dalai Lama has relinquished his political role putting an end to a 368-year-old tradition of the Dalai Lama being both the spiritual and the temporal or political head of Tibet. He has handed over that responsibility to Lop Singh Sange, the elected leader of the Central Tibetan Administration based in India's Dharamsala. And how is China treating those residing in the Tibetan Autonomous Region today? Well, the reports are grim. China is coercing thousands of Tibetans into mass labor camps. Chinese authorities in Lhasa have banned the teaching of the Tibetan language in schools. There are rising cases of detained Tibetans, closed trials, unknown charges and verdicts against Tibetan religious minorities in China. What's more, if you want a government job in the Tibetan Autonomous Region, you have no choice but to renounce the Dalai Lama and declare loyalty to the CCP. In the final analysis, China may have got the land of Tibet by force, but what it has lost forever is the peace-loving people of Tibet, many of whom now see India as their home. Parents would identify with this one. If your teenager is glued to her phone, do you sometimes feel like chucking the handset in the trash? If yes, you aren't alone. Parents are indeed worried about the disproportionate number of hours that children spend on phone, and even more about their safety and mental health. After all, social media can be a great way to connect, but let's face it, there's a dark side to it too. So are these tech companies to blame for the risks our kids face online? Before we get into that, watch this video. Senator, I, I think I've already answered this. I mean, this is these well, are issues. Well, try us again. Will you take personal responsibility? Senator, I view my job and the job of our company as building the best tools that we can to keep our community safe. Well, you're failing at that. To, well, Senator, we're doing an industry-leading effort. We build AI oh, tools nonsense. that- Oh, nonsense. Your product is killing people. Will you personally commit to compensating the victims? You're a billionaire. Will you commit to compensating the victims? Will you set up a compensation fund? Senator, with your money. I think these are-, these are With your money. Senator, these are complicated Yes, that, no, that, that's not a complicated I, I, question, though. That's Senator, a yes or no. Will you set up a victim's compensation fund with your money, the money you made on these families sitting behind you? Yes or no? 
Senator, I don't think that that's uh, my job. Is to sounds make sure like a no. Good tools. My, my sounds job like a is no. to make sure that we your job is to be responsible for what your company has done. You've made billions of dollars on the people sitting behind them. Are you here? You've done nothing to help them. You've done nothing to compensate them. You've done nothing to put it right. You could do so here today and you should. That's Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg apologizing to parents at a U.S. Senate hearing for the harm that his social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, caused to their children. The kids had taken their own lives after being extorted for money by sexual predators they found online. Social media can be addictive. It can lead to anxiety, depression and even sleeplessness. On top of that, it's full of unrealistic portrayals that can mess with the self-esteem of children. Cyberbullying is a major risk. Children and teens often become victims of this online harassment. Predators target children on social media, they sexually exploit them, extort money and even sell them drugs. Now, figuring out what is safe to share online can be tough for kids and teens. With all this news about the dangers of social media, it's no surprise that parents are getting increasingly worried. There is even talk about banning the whole thing to keep kids safe. In March this year, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a new law. The law banned children under 14 from owning social media accounts in Florida. It's said to be one of America's most restrictive social media bans for minors. The law requires parental permission for 14 and 15 year olds to have a social media account. However, the law still faces legal challenges. Critics call it unconstitutional. They say the government should not interfere with decisions parents make regarding their children. Many believe this is against free speech rights enshrined in the US Constitution. Others argue children need to be prepared for a tech-driven world. But Florida is not alone. Several other states like Utah, Louisiana, Arkansas and Texas passed laws in 2023 requiring parental consent for children to use social media. However, in Arkansas, a federal judge temporarily blocked the enforcement of the new law. So this in turn prevented the state from becoming the first to impose such a restriction. Therefore, making a law is one thing and implementing it is another. In May 2023, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy raised red flags about social media and kids. That warning sparked a big push for action. Over 30 U.S. states, including California and New York, have filed a lawsuit against Meta Platforms, Inc. That lawsuit accuses Meta of intentionally designing addictive features on Facebook and Instagram for children. These features, according to the states, are worsening a mental health crisis among the youth. What's more, the states also accuse Meta of violating children's online privacy laws by collecting their personal data without parental permission. But Meta isn't alone. Social media platforms like TikTok, Snapchat and YouTube are facing hundreds of similar lawsuits. Earlier this year, US senators grilled CEOs of the biggest social media companies of the world. What you can see is Discord CEO Jason Citroen, Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel, TikTok CEO Shuzi Chu, ex-CEO Linda Yaccarino and Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Senators accused the companies of having blood on their hands for failing to protect children from escalating threats of sexual predation on their platforms. We make careful product design choices to help make our app inhospitable to those seeking to harm teens. X has zero tolerance towards any material that features or promotes child sexual exploitation. Lawmakers held the hearing to address concerns of parents and mental health experts that social media companies care more about making money than protecting children on their platforms. Businesses target children because they are impressionable. They can be easily influenced at a young age. And so businesses can build brand loyalty that can last a lifetime. For these tech companies, attracting younger users presents a potential advantage in securing advertisers. These advertisers may find value in reaching a growing audience who might continue to engage with their products as they mature. Now let's go back to the legislative efforts. How about keeping the legislations aside for a moment and focusing on their effective implementation? Because 
While there are some guidelines in many countries for use of social media, these are hardly followed. Consider this. A parent or those responsible for enforcement may try to prevent the opening of an account by a child, but the child can still find another way to open one. Let's see what various other countries are doing in this regard. India introduced the Digital Personal Data Protection Act last year. It addresses the data privacy concern pertaining to children. This law mandates a verifiable parental consent if a minor wants to open a social media account. China has limited the use of Douyin, the domestic version of TikTok owned by ByteDance, to 40 minutes per day for teens. However, the international version of TikTok offers a seemingly more lenient one-hour daily limit for teens. Critics argue this limit is superficial as it can be easily turned off. Well, Europe's going the school route. France, Italy, Netherlands, they have all banned phones in classrooms. The UK even gave teachers the power to search bags and take phones away. But what about outside school, at home, on holidays? That's where things get tricky, right? So social media is a powerful tool, but it needs to be used responsibly. Now the question is whether banning is the solution. There are definitely no easy answers. Well, that's all in this edition of Connecting the Dots. We'll see you next week with more raging issues that touch our lives and imagination. Goodbye for now from all of us in the Delhi newsroom. This is Munman Paracharya signing off. Take care. Thanks for watching.